Good afternoon. Welcome to the first town hall meeting of 2021 for the School of Pharmacy. And I thank you all for your active participation. I'd like to go through the usual tips before we begin. Your audio and video will be automatically muted. Only the panelists can unmute themselves. The chat function is disabled. For questions for participants, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Any questions that we're not able to answer today, as always, will be answered via email, or if anonymous, we'll, we'll try to answer it at the next town hall. As always, we'll hold all questions until the end of the presentation. So just a few announcements as always. Um, I thought I would first just spend a few moments talking about UCSF and where we are on the search. You all read the newspapers, so you know how the, uh, the Bay Area is doing, how California is doing, the US, the world and beyond. But, um, and Desi can probably talk about this a little bit later as well. We're kind of hanging in there in the mid fifties in terms of COVID infected patients at UCSF. Uh, this is actually a welcome number because at one point, uh, just a couple weeks ago, we were in the mid 90s. Of those uh, 54 patients today, when I checked today, 24 are in critical care areas. And that's important always to highlight that because it's the uh, needs in critical care that are particularly important. And we also keep track of how much space we have in the critical care area. So, with 24 in critical care, that's at a, that's a 77% um, uh, fillage at the moment. And of those 24, 16 require uh, actual ventilation and one is on ECMO. And for those that don't know what ECMO is, that is uh, uh, a what's called extracorporeal um, oxygenation. What that is, is literally oxygenating the blood but not doing it in traditional ways through the lung. Um, that's for particularly sick patients. A few recent uh, changes. Um, one, some incredibly good news. We have all these student vaccinators uh, in the school who already have done a lot and are being asked to do a lot. And I will tell you, and I'm really going to compliment the State Board of Pharmacy at this point. Literally, Tuesday, all the deans of schools of pharmacy in the state of California sent a letter to the State Board of Pharmacy. The topic uh, was specifically asking if the state board could loosen up the requirement that only pharmacists, frankly, pharmacists that had already been trained to vaccinate could be the preceptors of pharmacist interns. We said it didn't make sense that why not nurses or physicians or other individuals. We literally sent the letter to them on Tuesday by yesterday, Wednesday, they replied that they were going to uh, bring a waiver forward. And so now, in fact, it does not require a pharmacist to be there for uh, these intern pharmacists to be vaccinated. So incredibly important, especially, and Lisa and Desi will talk about this later, uh, student vaccinators are an incredibly important part of the workforce as it relates to trying to take on this really massive national, state, and local undertaking. Couple other things I wanna remind you, and you received a notice of it today already, that the UCSF's third anti-racism town hall will take place tomorrow at 12 noon. There will be a bit more of a focus this time on faculty, but uh, I welcome everybody to join with, with what has been really, I think, informative and wonderful communication about anti-racism efforts at UCSF. All of you should have received an email uh, in, emphasizing that we launched the Foundations of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion training module. This is something all UCSF members will uh, must take. Uh, you should have received notice just three days ago, January 25th, about this. If you have any doubts, do what you can uh, to look at, um, you can just basically go on the, uh, uh, the UCSF website and you will find that in the training module 
uh, section, this one particularly. And so uh, if you have any trouble with that, please contact me and I'll point you the right direction. I wanna take a moment here uh, to first acknowledge Michael Nordberg. Uh, we've done it in writing, we did it at the full faculty meeting, but I wanna do it now at this last town hall. Um, our outgoing Associate Dean for Administration and Finance in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, Michael has given his heart and soul to the School of Pharmacy, uh, the ultimate team player, the ultimate firefighter, and a man with vision as well in terms of taking our school in a place where I feel quite comfortable. I'm uncomfortable that Michael's leaving, but I'm quite comfortable that we will not miss a beat. And a lot of it has to do with the preparatory work that Michael has done. You all know him well, um, past uh, recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Exceptional University Management. And again, uh, just uh, a wonderful colleague. I wish we could you know, have a celebration. Um, I, I, I suggested maybe another one of those virtuals. I think Michael said, well, let's, why don't we hang tight for a little bit on that? My real goal is I'm hoping we can celebrate all our retirees and other individuals who essentially are leaving chairships, et cetera. I'm really hoping we're gonna use Elizabeth Daniels uh, funds to really put on a nice get together for the entire school. But of course, there's a big asterisk to that and that'll be when we can, but that is still gonna be the goal. So Michael, from my heart, thank you for everything that you've done for us. Um, and I wish you and Suzanne your very best in retirement. So that means I also uh, would like the opportunity to introduce the incoming Associate Dean for Administration Finance in the School of Pharmacy, effective March 1, and that's Alicia Woods. I'm going to, while I wrote about this to all of you, I wanna just uh, remind you that Alicia comes to us with a couple decades of experience in administration and financial management. In the last 10 years, she served as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Department of Physiology. As with Michael, Alicia has been the recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Exceptional University Management. She is also a three-time recipient of the School of Medicine's Achievement Award. I know for a fact she has exquisite ability to take on the most complicated financial space and HR situation while still maintaining superb vision and strategies. We're very lucky to have her. And I also wanna thank the search committee one more time. And that was Chair Amal Smith and our School of Pharmacy colleagues, Diana Copeland, Jacqueline Fabius and Joanna Trammell and Associate Dean for Administration, David Ryan with the School of Nursing. So now uh, before I move on, I actually, let me just say one more thing well, before I turn this over to Alicia, just for a bit here. I also wanna acknowledge uh, Michael, who his last day will be next Monday. Um, I wanna thank James Joves, our Chief Financial Officer, who has, uh, uh, is willing to accept the interim Associate Dean for Administration and Finance for the week, I mean, for the month of February. Thank you, James. Uh, I thank you uh, before uh, personally, but I want to, in front of everybody, as you've always done, stepping to the help out the various departments in the dean off, dean's office, and I'm grateful that you did this as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Alicia, and who will then turn it back to me, and I will um, uh, get things going for the um, the specific topics in this particular uh, town hall. So, Alicia. Thank you. I'll be brief. I'm uh, super excited to be joining the School of Pharmacy family. I'm looking forward to working with everyone and hopefully seeing everyone uh, when the time is right. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So back to me. Um, so as I, so our topical program today is going to center upon the coronavirus vaccines. There are so many questions about this. There's so many misconceptions. And I'm now gonna hand it over to Grant Burningham, the school's editorial director, who will introduce today's presenters. Grant. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> um, as Joe mentioned, the topic of the town hall today is the COVID vaccines. And critically, the efforts at UCSF to vaccinate our population and the country at large. 
So on that note, we're lucky to have Desi Kotis with us here today. She's the Chief Pharmacy Executive at UCSF Health and an Associate Dean and Faculty Member in the School of Pharmacy. And we also have Lisa Ikroon, who's the Chair of the Department of Clinical Pharmacy. Uh, both, of, both of them have been instrumental in distributing the COVID vaccine for UCSF. As Joe said, we will have some time after their presentations for questions and answers. So feel free to type those into Zoom now and we will get to them as soon as Lisa and Desi are done speaking. Uh, so first up, Lisa Kroon. Uh, Lisa, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having uh, me. I'm gonna to switch to my slides. Okay, can you see my slides all right? Okay. So um, just as a starting point for us with the COVID pandemic uh, that started last February, March, uh, really, you know, what was our school and our Department of Pharmaceutical Services commitment around uh, caring for patients with the COVID pandemic? And our stance was really that our pharmacists must remain in the front lines to continue to provide care during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that our pharmacy profession is an essential part of the efforts to vaccinate communities and to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So that's really our, our framework for what we were doing here. Um, Joe mentioned the recent change uh, or waiver in the Board of Pharmacy, but just some background around COVID-19 uh, vaccination. So uh, licensed pharmacists in the state of California are able to independently initiate and administer vaccines, but these need to be part of what's considered the routine immunization schedule that's set forth by the CDC and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. So we actually had to go to pharmacy law and have waivers uh, or executive orders instituted by the governor to allow us to administer the COVID-19. And that was issued in uh, September 24th. And then mid-December, um, the ratio of a pharmacist to pharmacy intern who's administering vaccines was expanded. So usually the ratio of a pharmacist to an intern is one to two. It was expanded to one to three. And then mid-December, it was even further expanded to four to one, which really provides uh, another great opportunity for our students to play a role. And then as Joe mentioned just yesterday, um, the supervision of our students was expanded to allow physicians, nurse practitioners, and uh, physician assistants to be able to supervise our pharmacy interns or pharmacy students. And this is gonna be really critical as uh, California uh, starts more vaccination kind of mega sites where we may not have faculty, but if there's a physician organizing it or a nurse practitioner, they'll be able to supervise. So really exciting about that. Hey Lisa, Lisa? Uh, I'm just gonna interrupt for one second. We're having a little bit of mic problems. I don't know, maybe you can get okay. closer to your microphone. Let me, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's very clear. Okay. Yes, much better. I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna talk louder, sorry all. So um, if you go to the UCSF website right now, you're gonna see Dr. Valerie Kleinard's picture um, and the title is Leaders in Learning. So as Joe mentioned in early September, we anticipated our students playing a key role in vaccinating uh, patients for the COVID-19 vaccine. And we trained our entire first year class in order to partake in this effort. So currently today, our school pharmacy support has been primarily around two different roles, serving as vaccinators and helping with the pharmacy operations with the Department of Pharmaceutical Services. So in December, uh, when we first kicked off the first site uh, at uh, Parnassus on December 16th, it was actually our pharmacy students and pharmacists that were playing the main role as vaccinators. Starting January, agency nurses have been brought in, uh, but we're really proud that it was actually our pharmacists and students really serving in that role. Um, Val Kleinard conducted a training uh, for six additional pharmacists to play this role, uh, one faculty member and actually five of our medical center pharmacist colleagues, and she's planning to repeat this training. Um, for UCSF and some of our UC partners and other key sites. Our students are also playing a key role to support the pharmacy operations. So at each of these sites, we basically have a mini pharmacy on site. 
And so our students are, are helping staff serving as compounders and dose issuers for them. So a lot of the efforts in December were really just in time. We were working minute by minute, day by day. Uh, we developed a Zoom training that was uh, held on December 16th. Trang Trin, our faculty member led that with the first clinic starting the next day. All the training materials needed to be developed. Um, our school played a, lo a lot of role in that. Lots of logistics, uh, won't go into the details. I wanna do a shout out to Lisa Duke and my executive analyst who worked with me off hours and weekends to get all these logistics put together. Believe it or not, UCSF didn't have an acute allergic reaction protocol of what to do if somebody actually has an anaphylactic reaction, which we know is a concern for some of the vaccines. So we were able to put that together in short order. Fortunately, this is our, it, already part of pharmacist scope and practice, so we were uh, playing that role. The vaccines are drugs, and so we, as any UCSF uh, new drug, we have to have a, a monograph. It has to be approved by our pharmacy and therapeutics committee and executive medical board. So those monographs were produced. Candy Sarunas and our Medication Outcome Center worked in short order to get those uh, rush approval. So moving forward, our students, as I mentioned, are mainly going to be supporting or prioritizing the pharmacy operations role. Um, I didn't want this to be a separate rotation for them. I worked closely with Tram Cat and Judy Tran, our experiential directors, just to see how we can incorporate this into IPIs and APIs for our students. And we did a similar approach for our residents. And then moving forward, of course, lots of opportunity for volunteering still as vaccinators. So uh, the mobilization efforts in December were just really uh, amazing to see. Um, it, was, it was actually a, a remarkable response from all health professional students that were medical, dental, nursing there, as well as pharmacy. But if you just take a look here, we've had over 190 students participate already in these shifts. All of our residents are involved and more than 100 pharmacists and technicians have been redeployed to support this effort. And I'll close with just some pictures here. This shows the first arrival of the Pfizer vaccine on the left, um, kind of the size of a pizza box. Uh, these are uh, some pictures of the first day. Matthew Aludino, a, th a third year pharmacy student, actually was the first to administer a vaccine to an employee at UCSF. And then the other shot there is Marilyn Stebbins, one of our students uh, who were uh, serving as vaccinators there. Um, we, of course, are very concerned around uh, making sure people get the right vaccine. We, these are not interchangeable. So the pharmacy department has a, bought special labelers called codonics to make sure uh, there's absolutely no confusion. And they've tried their best to have, you know, the Moderna vaccine just at, at Mission Bay and the Pfizer vaccine at, at Parnassus. So Mission Bay M and uh, P for Parnassus Pfizer. Um, this just shows you an example of these mini pharmacies that we've built on uh, each of the sites uh, where the compounding is happening. And then I know this is all about vaccine, but I did have to put a shout out around our our uh, pharmacist providers actually caring for patients with COVID. Um, many are heavily involved. Um, our, our infectious disease pharmacist faculty, Con and Catherine Kathy, that service is just, you know, uh, so busy. They're working 24 seven supporting that. Of course, we have new therapeutics uh, treating patients with COVID. And so uh, our faculty and pharmacists and ID have been playing a really important role there including Kathy Yang. And then finally, uh, the school is working to develop some public education mini videos um, to help put out, you know, dispel some of the myths and questions that pe the public have about the COVID vaccine. So I just want to put a sh huge shout out to the entire pharmacy team for all of their efforts. And then it's uh, my pleasure to uh, pass it off to my colleague, Desi. Thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Get my screen up here really quick. Okay. All right, well, it's 
Great to be with all of you and we will have time for questions and discussion. So um, Lisa gave you some really great background. I wanted to show you a couple of visuals. Um, as uh, you know, we started on December 16th. You know, as I reflect, and I've been in this profession a long time, this is not only a historical moment, but just an amazing, amazing time for our profession and for uh, everybody who is a pharmacy provider from a technician to a student to a pharmacist. So you could see here uh, where we are. And again, you can see we've, uh, we started around January 15th vaccinating patients. Those were patients 75 and older. Looks like this weekend we will uh, open it up to 65 and older. And then you could see where we are, uh, the blue line being healthcare workers uh, students. Uh, and again, th these were all vul vulnerable population or vulnerable workers who uh, needed, who worked with COVID patients or persons of interest. And we'll talk a little bit about what, to, what we're doing next in future phases with those who are either complete remote workers or those who don't uh, see patients in our administrative and um, may come in at least a couple times a week to campus and where the phasing will begin. Uh, for those that are on site at least once a week, they will be in the next phase. Um, and so we could talk about that more. So here are uh, the statistics uh, in a, a little different format. We are also vaccinating um, non-UCSF healthcare workers and first responders. So uh, almost 20,000, uh, we're probably over 20,000 now since uh, these slides were done. And then uh, we, we show you what we've done with our folks. And this does not include the mega site that opened uh, just about a week ago uh, at City College where our first day we did 550 uh, patients over 75. And starting tomorrow, they've been closed for a couple of days due to high winds and the weather. Starting tomorrow, they'll be uh, ramping up to 1,000. So we are really increasing uh, our numbers uh, quite significantly. Uh, this is uh, everybody's favorite slide, super busy. Um, and again, you could see this was from the beginning of the week where, um, where you see the vertical line. But um, again, we're pharmacists, so we, we need to color track by brand of uh, Pfizer or Moderna. You know, is this first dose allocation or second dose? So you could see, for example, on December 22nd, the 7,900 first dose matches another 7,900 right here, second dose. So it's sort of a Jack and Jill mix of, you'll get your allocation of your second dose for people and, and where you are. And this is really um, Avi uh, Tutman and Julia Wang and others, um, uh, Sarah Coleman, Sana Swice, uh, our analysts who are working on our run rates and when we would run out of vaccine, depending on the scenarios. So again, the supply has been somewhat erratic. It's not your normal uh, vac flu vaccine supply or any uh, vaccine supply. So we are being allocated uh, through University of California as a multi-county entity. So all five campuses in California receive allocation. You know, sometimes I hear on Wednesday what we're going to get next Tuesday. Sometimes I'll hear like I haven't heard yet this week. Uh, so hopefully it'll be by uh, 10 p.m. tonight that we'll know what we're going to get and about when delivery will happen. So again, um, it is a, it's a very slow and um, erratic process, but um, we keep going and I am really proud of what um, all of you and and the, uh, the school, the, the, the students and the faculty and the entire pharmacy team has accomplished. So um, here's where we are uh, as far as the phasing. And you can see we started the day we received vaccine on December 16th. So everyone in that high risk uh, worker, first responder, 1A group, whether you're a custodian, whether you're a patient transport, a respiratory therapist, a pharmacist, doctor, nurse, um, that group is pretty much done. There still are some that are 
coming in, they may have gotten their first dose uh, rotating in Fresno. Now that um, that person's on rotation in San Francisco, they may be getting their second dose. Uh, we started, uh, as I said, on the 15th of January with our uh, patients 75 and older. Um, and then on the 19th, we started with healthcare workers uh, that are not UCSF first responders um, that are coming to the Parnassus site. And I know there's no date here, but this uh, we're, they're actually making the decision at a meeting that I'm missing right now, but I'm almost positive that 65 and older will probably start, uh, if not tomorrow, over the weekend. We are going seven days a week. We're not breaking for any holidays uh, or weekends. And then you can see um, the next group will start. Um, this looks like it's in February. These are fluid changes. Monday, we heard you know, that the governor is going all age-based. Um, and you know, so every day we hear new things and we need to, to make some changes. But um, again, uh, we will see uh, on-site workers probably, I know this says February, but it, it's, it's basically next week where if you're on-site at least one day a week, uh, you will be able to come and get your vaccine. And then again, um, as we phase out, you could see uh, those um, plans up above. Lisa showed uh, our sites. Uh, Parnassus uh, will be ramping up. There's a um, uh, probably a ramp up to uh, close to a thousand um, vaccines a day. Mission Bay, we moved to the Rudder Center. Um, that will be at least a thousand a day. And then uh, we do have uh, a, a, a site and, at Oakland. And then the city college site, uh, we, um, we're also doing about 40% uh, San Francisco city uh, uh, people, residents in San Francisco County as well. And that site uh, starts ramping up from like the 550 a day that they did to now um, 1,000 a day. Here's the photo of the city site and you can see the various uh, lanes, it's completely drive through. We were gonna open a site because there is a muni station nearby for walk-ins. Um, and right now uh, the city is, again, this is a city site. It's, it's we're, we're helping staff it. We're providing vaccine, obviously doing a lot for it, but uh, the city wants to make sure they have uh, safety precautions for you know, a tent for walk-ups, but this is what the site looks like. And here you could see another view from lane one all the way down. And, you know, we can adjust uh, doses and, you know, the thought is to ramp up to, to at least 3,000 a day or whatever the city um, would decide. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Desi, um, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'm going to start out with a question which came up while we were preparing this video series on the vaccine, which is uh, there seems to be kind of a lack of information in certain areas. And uh, one of the questions was whether or not pregnant women should should get the vaccine. The CDC seemed to recommend that they should get the vaccine. And then the World Health Organization said in particular that they should avoid the Moderna vaccine for the time being. Um, what do we know about pregnant women and how do we balance all this information we're getting from different sources? Lisa, do you wanna start? Sure, I can start. So, I mean, this is any guideline, different bodies have different recommendations. Um, it's my understanding that we are still going by the CDC, Center for Disease Control, and not the change in the WHO, where um, our guidance to uh, pregnant women is to discuss with their healthcare provider in a shared de decision making. And certainly if they're in an at risk or high risk group that they are being encouraged to consider taking the vaccine. Okay, great. Just a reminder for everyone, um, the question and answer is open if you wanna ask them in Zoom. We're gonna go a little bit long so we can get to some of these questions. And we will also take questions on school business generally. So any type of questions you have. Uh, 
let's see, this was answered in the chat, but I'm gonna ask it really quick. Is there any word on the staff receiving vaccines who are not in the greater San Francisco area for those of us who are working from home away from campus? Yep, so again, uh, as I said, if you're on campus at least once a week, uh, you will be in the next phase, which uh, starts in the beginning of February. If you're 65 or older, um, that could be as soon as this weekend. So, but the whole, it, the, 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 the state and others, uh, CDPH really states you have to be on site and how we're defining on site through the chancellor's uh, executive team is at least on site one day per week. Um, this is a question for both of you. Does vaccinating the healthcare workers outside of UCSF slow down the ability to vaccinate UCSF workers, uh, or do you get extra vaccines to accommodate the community? Yeah, uh, do you want me to start that one, Lisa? So um, actually we did, and we have been receiving vaccine from the county, from SFDPH. Um, again, uh, it's, it's about the people at highest risk. So what we've been vaccinating or who we've been vaccinating since the 19th are healthcare workers at very high risk in that 1A population. We've completed 1A for UCSF uh, quite a bit ago, except for maybe a few people. But um, again, there's definitely room for, for uh, UCSF, but this is first responders and high risk healthcare workers in San Francisco and we are getting supply. We actually got our first tranche from San Francisco Department of Health. There were a couple of weeks where the surges were so bad in Southern California that um, as a collective, we all decided uh, that our vaccine should go to Southern California. So UC Davis, UCSF did not receive vaccine for two weeks. So guess who gave us vaccine? That was San Francisco Department of Public Health. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Lisa typing out an answer to this. So I'm gonna interrupt her typing. For cancer survivors, would it be safe to take the mRNA vaccine? I'll, I'll verbally, I was just typing that. So, um, you know, there's no reason we would, that you should not be able to. The CDC does have guidance on people who may be immunocompromised. Uh, you may have less of a response. There could be a concern about certain chemotherapy agents. And so the question was about a survivor, but you may be on something still. So best to speak to your oncologist or, or other healthcare provider before getting vaccinated. Um, this is a question for both of you. Uh, and this is uh, something I'm curious about. When will the vaccination start to make an impact on the spread of the virus at large? Yep, so um, really, uh, you know, you could see from the data that after the first dose, um, and again, Pfizer and Moderna are very, very similar, uh, there's quite a bit of protection. I think Lisa is, isn't around eight to 10 days even after the first dose. But again, um, you know, these are a two dose combination, and um, there's this thing called herd immunity that I'm sure Joe could talk about. but um, we, we need to get quite a few people vaccinated before we can let down our guard. So even though, um, you know, we receive our first or even uh, both doses, we'll st we still need to social distance, mask, and uh, obviously uh, use uh, proper hand hygiene. So um, it, it will be some time. Lisa, did you want to add the specifics? Oh, I, I think that's... Uh, <laughs> There's differing, you know, depending, depending, listen, Dr. Fauci versus others, uh, Paul Offit in Philadelphia, that they have different thresholds for the herd immunity, but I, I think we'll just have to see. Yeah, I think they say, uh, George Rutherford, 65%, 70% vaccinated. Um, again, whether you're in your house, you might feel a little more comfortable if you've, you know, you're a few weeks post your second uh, dose of vaccine, but... Again, um, a lot to follow. I know the one real controversial thing right now is the data um, and the announcements about getting your second dose within six weeks. Um, so whether it's Moderna or Pfizer now, you know, Moderna is 28 days, Pfizer is 21 days. 
it's still recommended to get your second dose in that time, 21 or 28 days respectively. But now, you know, because it is a booster, there is some thought that uh, it could go six weeks. We're not recommending that, but um, right now, again, things are changing and, you know, we're seeing more and more um, evidence come out. So I just wanted to bring that up as well. Okay. This is a quick comment from uh, one of our faculty members, Conan McDougall in the chat. The vaccine protects well against symptomatic disease, but the extent to which it protects against transmission of the virus is not known. Israel will be the place to watch as they have vaccinated 25% of their population already. So not a question there, but a comment. Um, here's a question. How is the campus staff being notified of when to book an appointment? Yep. So um, we are using, uh, if, if you do have my chart or if you don't have my chart, uh, it's recommended uh, that you, this is um, kind of the old way. There is a new scheduling and open scheduling uh, system that's coming on board. But um, what has been done uh, thus far for UCSF employees and patients is through my chart. Um, there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, this new open scheduling happening that should be easier. It's on the website. Um, and for those that may have language difficulties or um, technology uh, isn't their friend, there is a, uh, a phone line that can be uh, utilized for booking appointments. Okay, I'm just going to do two more questions really quick. Um... First up, do you see differences of efficacy and side effects in various race, ethnicity, and age groups? Um, go ahead, Lisa. Well, uh, um, I, I'm, my understanding is they're actively, we are actively tracking at UCSF Health and UCSF for adverse events. And, and that data uh, will be analyzed for any differences by age, race, ethnicity. Um, the clinical trials for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine did see a difference in by age. So more senior people uh, seem to have actually less uh, side effects such as the flu-like flu symptoms, um, which are just a sign of the immune system being, you know, response being mounted. So there is a, a difference by age, certainly for the, some of the uh, more acute uh, reactions. Okay, thank you. And the last question, will the vaccine need to be annual like the flu? Yeah, I don't think anyone knows yet. Um, I know there's some data, probably Conan can answer this question as well. Um, if we, there will be boosters needed at two years or at, at three years, I don't know, Lisa, if you have any other data on that. Yeah, just they're speculating now and then with the uh, variants out there, whether that will, will trigger a need for a booster, but I don't think we know exactly when that will be. We don't know. Okay, thank you both so much for your time and for answering those questions. Um, Joe, I'm gonna toss it back to you really quick. Thank you, Grant. And uh, thank you, Desi and Lisa. I appreciate uh, you taking the time, especially Desi, when you had um, another meeting that you, uh, maybe we got you out of a meeting, so maybe you should thank me, come to think. <laughs> But no, seriously, thank you both. And, um, and thank you, Alicia, for joining us for your inaugural town hall. Uh, we look forward to uh, having you meet all of us. Um, and uh, best of luck, Michael Nordberg. In the meantime, please be safe, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.